Good morning. Good morning. It is exciting to hear the family of God just fellowshipping together and enjoying one another's company. If you're out in the foyer, you can make your way in. We're going to get started here in just a couple of minutes. Uh, pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. If you're joining us perhaps for the first time or one of the first times you've been here, a special extended welcome to you also. And if you're joining us online, we're just thrilled to have you join us. Uh, this morning and hope that uh, you will enjoy uh, this service uh, there in your home as well. Just a couple of things this morning. Please be praying for Pastor Tim. He's going to be away on vacation this week, so be in prayer that uh, he will be able to come back rested. Uh, you've all taken vacations you've not felt rested at the end of, so be praying that that takes place for him. And continue to pray for Pastor Chad as he's wrapping up his sabbatical here in very short order. We're looking forward to having him back in the office uh, here in August. And uh, I think that's all that we need to cover. There's uh, everything else you need to know you should be able to find in the bulletin that you picked up on your way in this morning. Uh, and if you're joining us live stream, you can find that on our website as well. Let's bow for a word of prayer as we begin our service this morning. Lord, we thank you for being God. We thank you for being who you are. Today, as we present ourselves before you as a church family, as a congregation, and yet as individuals, may all that we do and say please you this morning. We pray that this offering of praise this morning would be sweet in your ears. And for these things we ask, in the name of Jesus, our Savior, amen. I would like us to begin this morning. Rise to your feet. I'd like us to read together from Isaiah chapter 53, verses 3 through 6. Let's begin. 
He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all.
exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. sin 
we continue to worship, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we are thankful for another Sunday that we can gather together with your people and worship you. Lord, we're most thankful for your son, for the confidence of salvation. Let we think of the words that Jesus spoke in John 5, where he said, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Lord, it's for that life that we thank you for this morning. We do pray for Pastor Chad today as his sabbatical is starting to wind down. And we think of Pastor Tim who's on vacation. Lord, we pray that you'd give them both physical rest and spiritual renewal. Lord, we now pray for Pastor Dan as he opens your word this morning and speaks the truth that the Holy Spirit has given him. We pray that he would speak clearly. Lord, may we hear it and apply it to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. It's always a pleasure to open up the word of God with my church family, and so I am Happy to be here this morning. The last time I was up here, I preached three times on a Sunday morning, so this is significantly easier for me, so I appreciate that. We're going to be in Romans chapter 3 this morning, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 3. And I would venture a guess to say that Romans 3 is one of those passages that we know really well. We've read it a lot of times. We've memorized large portions of it. And so I would invite you this morning, as we read it, to, to read it with fresh eyes. And what I hope to, to walk away with today is this. Four reasons why we as believers should be confident in our salvation. Four reasons why we as believers should be confident in our salvation. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. 
But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we open up this text, may we see clearly you. And may we walk away with a greater sense of love and confidence in what you've done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Often when we are sharing the gospel with someone, we might present this scenario before them. If you were to stand before the judgment seat of God and God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What would it, you say? Would you point to your right associations? Knowing that throughout your life you had always been part of the right groups, you had the right friend group, you came from the right family, you were from the right political party, the right education, the right country. Is that what you would point to? Would you defend yourself by pointing to all the good things that you have done? How good of a parent you were, how well your kids came out how successful you were in business, how many people you helped, the amount of church services you attended, the amount of money you've given to the church. Would you perhaps compare yourself to the people around you, knowing that you hadn't been perfect, but you're here on a Sunday morning and that guy down the street's mowing his lawn? This is a question of significant weight, isn't it? It reveals to you and to us what we are trusting in for our salvation. What do we have our spiritual confidence? What makes us confident that we are saved? Romans is a a letter written by the Apostle Paul to uh, the church in Rome, and he's writing in preparation for his visit, and he wants them to understand the implications or how the gospel works out in their life. And in chapters 1 and 2, Paul has established that all people are sort of in the same boat. Regardless of their family, their race, their connections, they're all condemned by the law. This law references back to the law of Moses. We think of like the Ten Commandments, but Jesus summarizes the law like this. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And in front of that law, none of us can say, I've done that every moment of every day. And so we are condemned by the law. And so here we come to Romans chapter 3 and verse 20, and we see the first of four things that give us confidence in our faith, give us confidence in our salvation. And the first one is this, no one is saved through their works. Verse 20 says, for by the works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Paul is quite plainly stating here that by your best efforts, by your works, by your goodness, by your right associations, you are not justified before God. None of that will have any bearing on whether you are saved or not. This is why in in verse 27, Paul then says this, then what becomes of our boasting? Is it excluded? But wait, by what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. Paul is reminding that there is nothing to boast in because it isn't our works that saved us. It's not our works that justify us. The Jews were so confident that because of their race, their family, their spirituality, their good works, that they had some sort of inside track with God that the Gentiles didn't have. I'm going to ask to be sarcastic for a moment here. Surely, no one today falls into that same trap. We wouldn't hold on to feelings of superiority over other people. We don't, look on, we don't look down on those people who haven't figured things out like we figured them out. Surely we wouldn't spend our time scoffing at the crazy things that those people say. Surely we would not put in our stock into what we have accomplished, what we have figured out, what we possess in our garage or our bank accounts. 
So certainly we don't need to be reminded by Paul that there is nothing to boast in. I'm done now. Justified. Fultz tells us here that we are not justified by our works. Justified is a, a legal term. It's a legal declaration by God that we are right in God's sight, that we have right standing before God. In our youth group, we say this often, justified is just as if I'd never sinned. But I think it is more than that. I think it is also just as if I'd always obeyed. So it's not just that I've, I've never did the wrong thing, but it's in every moment God is seeing me as if I had always done the right thing. And it's the legal declaration that before God, I have right standing. But here we see it's not by our works that we're justified. So how is that encouraging to us? Or if there is nothing that I can do to guarantee my salvation, how can I have confidence that I'm actually saved? I think it's a, a good question. Paul is reminding us here that we're not saved by our good works, so it can't be our sinful works that unsave us. Meaning, if our salvation is dependent upon, or partially dependent upon, or even has any connection to whether I can do the right thing every moment of every day, I should have no confidence, right? We make mistakes daily. And, and Paul is reminding us that you are not at risk of losing your salvation because you're sinful. It had nothing to do with your works. Believers, you're not at risk of losing your salvation if you had an argument with your spouse on the way to church this morning. Husband, you're not at risk of losing your salvation if you haven't led your home and wife well. Moms, you're not at risk of losing God's love for you because you've had it up to here with your children all week and they've made a mess. Believers, your salvation, your justification before God at the judgment seat was never about what you did or did not do. We have great confidence in our salvation because we are weak, frail people that mess up all the time. And it was never about what we could do or not do that saved us because no one is saved through their works. Point two, everyone is saved through the righteousness of God through faith in Christ Jesus. What is it? What is it that people are saved by? It's the righteousness of God that is received by faith. Through the first two and a half chapters of Romans, Paul has established this clearly that no one is righteous, no, not one. And here in 3:21 and 22, let's see what he says again. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Pause there. We are saved not by our own righteousness, but we are saved through somebody else's righteousness, someone else's right standing before God. We are justified by someone else who never sinned and did always obey. It's an imputed righteousness or an alien righteousness. Martin Luther says it this way, this righteousness is heavenly and passive. We do not have it of ourselves, we receive it from heaven. The righteousness that belongs to believers is an alien righteousness, one that isn't intrinsic to human beings. See, our standing before God does not rest in our good works, but in the good works of God himself. Through Jesus' perfect life, his death and resurrection, through his perfect submission to the Father and perfect completion of the law, being God in the flesh, Jesus had the requisite rightness to offer to needy people like us. The righteousness of the righteousness of God is infinitely sufficient to pay for our sin. How does Paul tell us that we receive this imputed righteousness? It's through faith. You receive the righteousness of God not when you did something right, but when you believed or trusted in Jesus Christ. Bruce Ware puts it this way, to believe in Christ or trust in Christ or to put faith in Christ means to count or rely completely on what Christ has done in his death and resurrection for my sin, so that my hope of being right in God's sight is all because of Christ and has nothing to do with any good thing that I might say or do. To believe in Christ means to count or rely completely on what Christ has done. 
In order to receive Christ's righteousness, we have to believe and rely on the truth that the only thing that we bring to the table is our own weakness and Christ's offered righteousness. It is not the strength of our faith, the power of our faith, or the amount of times we write faith on a board and put it up on our walls and our homes that justifies us. When you stand before the holy God and have to give an account for why you should enter his heaven, you will not say, I believe so hard. What you will do is you will point at Jesus and say, his righteousness. I trust in his righteousness. It's not that I believed. It's not that I just had faith. It's that I had faith in the person of Jesus Christ. Believers, you might be sitting there in your chairs and you might be struggling with whether or not you're saved right now. Maybe this is because of an ongoing sin issue that you need to continue to repent and trust God in. But maybe it's also because you're going through, as John of the Cross writes, a dark night of the soul. See how he describes that. God thus leaves them in darkness so great they know not whither to betake themselves with their imaginations or reflections of sense. They cannot advance a single step in meditation as before, the inward sense now being overwhelmed in this night and abandoned to the dryness so great that they have no more any joy or sweetness in their spiritual exercises as they had before. In their place, they leave nothing but insipidity and bitterness. We understand these dark nights of the soul, don't we? Where God feels distant, our spiritual time is dry and we're suffering we can be encouraged in those moments that our standing before God is not tied to how we feel not tied to how we're doing but it is tied in the person of Jesus Christ who died for our sins and the question is do you rely on his work but there are even times when our own thoughts and feelings betray us and we will feel abandoned by God and will feel so distant that it might feel like that we had never believed in those moments of doubt where we look to the cross and are reminded that it was only ever through trusting Jesus that we were ever saved. We weren't saved because we believed so hard, because we believed all the right things, or believed consistently every day. But we were saved by God through faith. And it's in those moments where we cling to God's word. 2 Timothy 2, uh, 13 says this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. Believers, if you have trusted in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you have received Christ's righteousness on, on your behalf. And so when God sees you, he does not see Dan's fallen sinful brokenness. He doesn't see Dan's faithlessness. He sees Christ's righteousness, and he cannot and will not deny himself. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. And so when we are struggling with our belief, we must remember that God has saved us. It wasn't, we aren't saved by our faith. We're saved by God to be received through faith. And even when we are weak, and even if we are faithless, he will not reject his own righteousness. First point is that we are not saved through our own works. Second point is that we are saved by God through faith. My third point is this. Everyone is saved by grace as a gift. Let's read uh, 23 and 25 here. Through 25. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift to the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. I was preparing the sermon and I, I, I struggled with this. I, I struggled with these verses and these are the most well known of the chapter and I, I was struggling because I'm like, I don't deserve this. I don't deserve to have assurance of my salvation. I don't deserve to have the righteousness of God. I don't deserve to have propitiation by his blood. And that is exactly the point Paul is trying to make here. We don't deserve it. This is a gift of grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor to undeserving people. If you deserve it, it's not grace. It's not a gift. Paul's been trying to make it clear to his readers that God does not have an easy path for the Jews and then a difficult path for the Gentiles. Neither of them are insiders. All of them are sinners. 
And so many times I think churchgoers and non-churchgoers fall into a trap on this. That, that there is no way that God would accept us, receive us, love us, save us if we're not good enough. The church people will see that and know that God has saved them, but are uncomfortable with their position, and so they have to make themselves look better so that God will continue to accept and love and receive them. And so what do they do? What do we do? We start working harder. We start making more rules. We look more different. We come to more church services. We give more money, hoping that if I do enough works, I'll have confidence that God will save me. Ultimately, their confidence, our confidence, becomes confidence in our own works, which Paul's reminded us we shouldn't have confidence in. Non-church goers will look at the gospel of God and say, there's no way I could deserve that. There's no way I could have a relationship with God. I talked with a man a while back who was open with me that he didn't believe in God, and even if he did believe in God, God wouldn't accept him because all that he has done. I think both of us need to hear this. You guys are exactly right. There is no earthly way that God would love you or accept you or receive you, but there is a heavenly one, isn't there? It is because of his unmerited favor to, towards undeserving people. It is because of his grace given to you as a gift that God has looked at undeserving sinners like us and out of his own goodness, out of his own character, he puts forth Jesus as a propitiation to be received by faith. Propitiation speaks to how God deals with our sin. It was the means by which God would take the guilt of our sin and give it to somebody else. In the Old Testament, that was through the offering of sacrifices. The, the dead animal would propitiate for the person, would die in the place, and, and the wrath of God would be poured on them. Jesus was the great sacrifice to end sacrifices. I love the word propitiation. I like it more when my five-year-old says it. It's one of those great words in the Bible. It teaches about, about how God deals with our sin. You see, the wages of our sin earns us death. And it isn't that God just wipes away the penalty of our sin, saying, you guys sinned, I'll just remove the punishment, it's okay. No, propitiation means that God himself pours out his wrath on Jesus, and Jesus, like a spiritual sponge, absorbs the wrath of God for us, so that now there is no wrath for God, for people in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has taken our punishment. He has propitiated for us so that we are accepted and received by God. God has seen the seriousness of our sin. And he sends Jesus to receive all of his anger, all of his wrath, and all of his judgment against sin on the cross. This is why Jesus prays in Matthew 26, 39, in the garden, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He was not looking forward to the wrath of God being poured out on him on the cross. See, Jesus took the full wrath of God for your sins. Your penalty is paid for. It's not sitting to the side somewhere in case you mess up. It's not because you deserved it. It's that God in his goodness offered to us a gift. So often we feel like we don't deserve to be saved or, saved or to be loved by God, and it's the point. Jesus says in his Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of, hell, of heaven. Those people that inherit the kingdom of heaven are who? The spiritually impoverished. Salvation is for those people who have realized that they have nothing to offer God but their own weakness. And they have received his gift of grace through Jesus Christ who took our sin and penalty on the cross where he dealt with it finally. We are encouraged because we did not deserve this gift. It was by grace we have confidence in our salvation, point four, because we are saved through God's character. Why does God do all of this? God does all this to demonstrate to people his righteous character. 
Look at verse 25, the end of 25. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God forgives our sins in this manner to demonstrate his righteous character. God does not compromise his character to forgive sinful people. God does not compromise his righteousness to forgive sinful people. Meaning that God does not get to the cross and we all of a sudden find out that our sin really isn't that big of a deal. That it doesn't really need to be punished. J.A. Packer rightly states this, that God has a holy antipathy against sin, a righteous hatred of evil which prompts him to exact just retribution when his law is broken. God does not contradict his character by forgiving sinners like us. Isn't, we don't come to the gospel and it's like, it's okay, love wins, you all get in, it's all right that you did all these terrible things, that you stole, that you're abusive, that you're racist, that you're prideful, that you're arrogant, I'll just take away your punishment, it's not a big deal. God doesn't just look at our sins and say, that's all right. But he demonstrates his righteousness, his rightness, his justice. He pours out the wrath. Our sin was paid for, not outside of God breaking his character, but he paid for it through Jesus Christ. Sin, the guilt of sin, was punished rightly, righteously, justly on the cross, showing God's righteousness. But God not only demonstrates his justice, but he also demonstrates his grace and mercy in that he doesn't only justly judge sin, but he justifies the sinners. He does it on our behalf. He pours out his judgment on sin onto his own son instead of us so that judgment could be rightly paid for. Why is this so encouraging? God is himself. He cannot be anything other than himself. If God contradicts himself and says, sin's not that big of a deal, then God's a liar and this gospel means nothing. God pays the penalty for our sin out of his own righteous character. And he does it for us out of his own gracious character. Your salvation is so secure because God, being righteous, does not overlook your sin, does not minimize your sin, does not contradict his character, but he took on all the fullness of his own wrath for you, and he took it upon Jesus himself. Your salvation is secured because the one to whom your debt is owed is the one who paid your debt. Your salvation is so secure because the one to whom your debt is owed is the one who paid your debt. Believers, what have we seen over and over? What is it that our confidence is in? Is it in what we bring to the table? Is it in the strength of our belief? Is it in our uh, deservingness? Is it in the fact that God doesn't really think is that serious? No. It's not. Our confidence and our salvation never came from us. Our confidence is in the person of Jesus Christ. The right standing before God that we have is the right standing of Jesus. The one we rely on is Jesus. The one who absorbed all of our punishment is Jesus. The one who demonstrated God's righteous judgment of sin was Jesus as he hung on the cross. The one who declares us right with God is Jesus. So what are we to do then? We cling to Jesus. What about when we're broken and and doubting our own faith? We cling to Jesus, knowing it was never about our faith. It was about his goodness. What about when things are going well and God is near to us? We cling to Jesus and we thank him for the blessing. What about when things aren't going well and God is far from us? We cling to Jesus. When you're overwhelmed and stressed with the weight of your life, you have to cling to Jesus. Cling to the one who has accepted you fully. Cling to the one who has declared you righteous. Cling to the one whose righteousness makes you right with God. Cling to the one who has loved you first. Cling to the one who took on all the weight of God's judgment for you. Cling to the one who lived a perfect life. Cling to the one who died a sacrificial death. And cling to the one who rose again. Cling to the one who promises life to those who believe in him. Brothers and sisters, daily we need to go to the cross and we need to be reminded 
of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ. Daily, we need to repent of the ways that we have not trusted in his cross, not trusted in the good news of the gospel that has saved us. And daily, we need to trust that our value, our hope, our confidence, our defense, our righteousness only comes from Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we, this morning, are a weak and frail people, undeserving of your love, and yet, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. You have demonstrated your great love for us in that you sent Jesus Christ to earth to live a perfect life, to submit to the law every moment of his life so that he could be a perfect sacrifice for sinful people like us. May we trust and cling and rely on the person of Jesus Christ who has done it all for us. And may we have great confidence in the God who saved us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's again stand together as we close our service in song this morning.
Enjoy the fellowship as you leave this morning.